Okay, I'm waiting. Oh, there you are. How's it going, Roseanne? Hi, Ben. How you doing? Good. How are you? <laughs> doing good. Doing good. I'm glad you, you could join me. me. Glad you could join. Thank you. Yeah. So how's how's it going with uh, uh, real estate? <clears throat> Well, I mean, I haven't had much guidance, and so I've kind of been just, you know, listening here, watching there, but I haven't really made, like, a first initial step until um, my neighbor approached me sometime a couple weeks ago, and he said that he was selling his house, his mom's house, because she oh. passed away. And um, so I've been trying to find someone like to go over the details with to see if it's a good deal. Um, and I will, I think I want to buy and hold it, but you know, yeah. I have to also ways like to get the, the funding without using your own money and you know, stuff like that. So I just was wondering if I'm going sure. about it the right way as far as like getting a mortgage and all that stuff. Okay. Okay. That is fantastic. So uh, what have you found out so far as far as like the numbers go? <clears throat> so numbers wise, um, comparatively speaking, it's it's a good price. I don't know if you have a, a way to like look up the address and. Yes, I do. Yeah. Yes, I do. Let me uh, let me look it up here. OK, I'm ready. Go ahead. It's a five nine six zero banana road. Banana Road. That's good. West Palm. Okay. Yes. All right. Okay. I see it. So um, they're asking, or my neighbor is asking 265. Um, it's a three one and a half. And I think it's like 1100 square feet. Close to 1100 square feet. Yeah. 1176. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and um, it does need some work, you know, like the roof is in the end of life. I did have an inspection done on it also. I had okay. an inspection done on it yesterday. Really? And, what What was the results? Um, I can send it to you. They, they pretty much talked about the roof. Uh, mm -hmm. The roof is in end of life, so it's going to need a new roof within the next two, two to two and a half years. Okay. Um, the AC is good. Um. The AC is only like five years old. Um, and the only other thing that was like a main, and it's not concrete, it's like wood sidings, which okay. was a little bit of a concern. Um, but they didn't see any um, termites or anything like that. And another um, fact about this house, which is why I want to buy and hold it, is it's actually the house right next to my parents' house. So I've seen this house pretty much my whole life. Okay. Um, and so it's so they know you they know you well right right they know me pretty, they know me pretty well and um the, my realtor friend that i've been talking to she's like they have to know you well that's the only reason why they would give it to you at that price <laughs> because she yeah, was like if he had an if he had a realtor he probably would have sold it for like 350 or 360 something close to that yeah uh, at least 340 i would say mm -hmm. yeah yeah, the um, I have access to the MLS, so I'm looking at the MLS, and the MLS puts it at about a minimum. So you get a range. So the mm -hmm. range here that I'm looking at is 303 to uh, 386, uh, okay. and the confidence on it is is four stars, which you know uh, at the at the least I would say 320. If uh, if you're motivated to resell it, uh, but no, you want to hold this one. This is good um, because uh, I'm looking at uh, batch leads, and on batch, it's uh, the estimated value is three twenty three, um, and uh, they don't have a mortgage. It doesn't look like no. they have a mortgage. Yeah, uh, her name is Joanne, right? Yeah, she's the one who passed mm -hmm. away. Oh man. So, okay, so so she passed away. H how long ago? Um, she passed away sometime in the summer, but the um, 
the brothers, her sons, weren't really ready to talk about the house and stuff like that until mm -hmm. maybe like end of October, middle of October is when they kind of approached me about it. And so okay. um, the house is also in, um, what's that word, probate? Yeah, so probate, yeah. Probate pro process. And so that is scheduled to complete like December 16, something like that. So that's okay. kind of when we're estimating we can close the deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, uh, that is fantastic. Fantastic. I think this is a really good deal. Um, uh, and they want to sell it to you for how much? 265. 265. Yeah. Okay. So, so uh, let me ask you this. How are you buying it as far as financing? Well, that's kind of what I've been seeking guidance about. Um, I could use all my savings and put a down payment and get a mortgage and all that. Um, but and which is kind of the route I have been leaning towards because I don't really know any other options. But mm -hmm. if there was another way to finance, I'm more than open to that as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I definitely understand that. So you have good credit, good enough to buy it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good, good, good. Uh, here's here's a couple things to think about when you when you buy. Uh, that strategy is called uh, Burr. They call it Burr is buy, uh, rehab, uh, mm -hmm. rent, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, refinance, mm -hmm. and then repeat. And so um, that, that strategy is good. It's solid. Uh, and it can work with this. Uh, the, the downside of it is that you are using your own credit. Right. So... Um, what I what I'm going to do is, and I'm recording this so I can uh, I can send it to you later as well, mm -hmm. so you can rewatch it because I'll I'll give you like a like a little bit of a of a, what I would do. Okay. So so this is going to be pretty much from my perspective, and and I want you to know that uh, my perspective, of course, is not the only perspective, uh, right. but this is what I think you should do uh, because it's what I would do, mm -hmm. and. Immediately uh, off the bat, I the, the first question I would have would be, who lives in the house? That's the first Current, question. Currently? Mm -hmm. Currently. It's, it's unoccupied. It's unoccupied. Okay, so that's huge. That's huge. That, that's, worth, that's worth the deal. Okay, so if it's vacant, then what you have to think about is uh, it's easy. It's, it's, it's a slam dunk. It's the difference between, <laughs> between <laughs> you know, you having, you having to go through five defenders uh, and having, having the court all to yourself and you can dunk that ball. You're right. It's really that how, how, how awesome this is. Uh, so at 260, uh, what I would do is I wouldn't focus so much on the price with this deal. If you want to hold stuff the, 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 and you don't want to use your credit, uh, which is what I, would, I wouldn't do, I would not use my credit. Uh, and the reason why is because it, it teaches you uh, to, to always be depending on your credit. Uh, and so let me give you three things that I think about as, as far as financing, which is what we're talking about with this deal so think about other people's money opm mm -hmm. other people's iras opi and other people's credit okay mm -hmm. and that's opc uh it so when i go through those three three scenarios i would say okay so my what is my source of funding it cannot be the bank because the bank gets you into a bad habit the bank makes most of the money. So when you go get a loan, uh, you will qualify. But over 30 years time, you're going to pay for that house three times over. Oh, yeah. So you know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. so, so, so how do you avoid that? Well, this is how I would do it. If I had a relationship with these guys, I would say, first and foremost, you know, uh, uh, what's, who, who are you dealing with? Who's the personal representative here? What's the name? Uh, his name is Corey, and he's the Corey. son. He's of, the son. Um, okay. 
Yeah. So, so first and foremost, Corey, um, you know, it's uh, my deepest condolences, et cetera. I'm, so, I'm sure you've already been through that conversation. Mm-hmm. And here is, here is the scenarios, Corey, how I can buy your house. Uh, uh, first of all, I can do it. I can go get my own loan and so forth. And 260 would be a good price. However, I think that I want to give you more than 260. And that goes against the grain because Mm -hmm. most people out there will even say, that's crazy. Why would you want to give, you already got a good deal at 260. Like the realtor friend that you were telling me, uh, she will say that that's insane. You know, once you get a deal, you know, you don't, you don't give them more than the 260, but I would give them 280 minimum. So I would say to Corey, Hey, look, I'll give you 280 for this property. If you guys are willing to, and I'm looking at props, I mean, a batch leads and there's no mortgage on this property. Okay. So that tells me that, that they own it free and clear. Right. So, so why not give Corey 280 and then have him sell you the property uh, as a seller finance deal? Say in 10 years, in 10 years, I'll have you completely cashed out and you will have 280 at the, at the end of 10 years. If you just give me monthly payments, monthly payments. And so then what you have is if he's willing to finance you, you can rent out the property. And this can be literally like your property. Uh, then the other thing you can do is you can go and get a small loan, say uh, 15000 And like I say, you just talk to friends or whatever. And somebody will give you a loan from your own network you currently have. Uh, 15, 20,000 to just make it nice and livable for a family to move in or a renter to move in. So you can cash flow the property and then uh, you pay them back with, with a portion of the rent. You give them some equity. So if you ask for a loan for 15 grand or 20 grand, uh, a money friend, right? And in exchange for that, they have part of the cash flow and they have equity. And you can do that with what is called tenants in common. Uh, and, uh, they probably, I would do, so if the house is worth 300,000, which is very well, could be worth more than, more than that, but let's say 30, I mean, 300,000, you can give them, if they give you 20 grand, um, give them 10 to, to 20% equity. And so that means that they make 10 to 20% of the cash flow. And now you have a cash flow in property. You didn't go to the bank and you will have that property free and clear in 10 years. Now, granted, uh, when you go to sell it, if you do want to sell it, I don't recommend selling. Uh, but if you do go to sell it, then uh, you know, you, you'll give your money partner 10% to 20% of the deal. But in the meantime, they made cash flow. I think that's the easiest way to do it. And I've done, two, I mean, plenty of deals like that. And uh, they're fantastic. So that's option number one. Option number two is you can still ask for seller financing, but with a balloon of three years, probably at least three years. Uh, and so what you can do is find somebody like I was seeing on the chat, somebody's a buying hold investor. So you can find a buy and hold investor who does creative uh, purchases and now they have the money and then ask to do a JV with them. You have the deal, you know, and, and say now in, in that case, you have smaller equity, but then you're, you're, you're also buying and holding. So they can do like a 4951 where they own 51 and you own 49. So you could do that as well. Right. <clears throat> and then they bring their financing to cash it out after three, three to 10 years. Uh, that's another strategy that works really good. And you can find people like that, you know, like really fast. Now, the other option is you can just take it as is, get a, a seller finance deal, not get a partner and start renting it out, okay, on your mm-hmm. own. And you just go in there and you, go, you get to work. You go to work, you do whatever you have to do. You use your own money to kind of make it look nice, uh, rentable, and then it's all yours. And then you can say to them, Hey, how about you allow me to make you payments over time? I'll give you 320,000, which is retail right now, right? So 
three twenty, I'll buy it at retail, no interest, but I'll cash you out in five years. You'll have all your money back. So that way, you allow the market to because it's correcting right now. So that that gives you time to see where the market is going to go. Uh, and in five years, you can at that point get a loan and refinance it. But now you can you can refinance at you know at that time hopefully three fifty uh, to maybe four hundred thousand so that way you get paid at that time as well uh, for and you get you get a lower equity because you've been making payments right so you you might be at uh, maybe total two eighty maybe two sixty the original price but they were able to make money so what you want to do is you want to make it a win-win for them there's a lot of people on YouTube training that you know you gotta beat people you know down on their price and stuff like because they want to wholesale it I understand that uh, but this is not a wholesale deal this is a buy and hold deal and I think that your gut instinct uh, is right on target so that's what I would do I would present those three instances to the seller and see what he thinks uh, and play with the play with the number. Don't look at the ARV as far as like uh, how it's being taught out there, because that ARV is only based on a wholesale exit strategy. So if your exit is is uh, buy and hold forever, which is what I recommend, because remember, it's not timing the market. When you are wholesaling, you're timing the market. That's what you're doing. You're speculating. Uh, but so it's not, it's not about timing the market. It's, it's time in the market. So you, you're buying and never selling, never selling. That's what you want to do. So how do you do that? So let, let's talk about the, 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 the difference or the spread. So if you're going to hold it, let's say for at least 30 years, well, the, the bank, if you get a loan, the bank is assuming that in 30 years, you will have paid, let's say, uh, easy five hundred and sixty thousand dollars because it's almost three times the amount. So right. that's your spread. Your spread is at least five hundred thousand dollars. So you can pay them um, three hundred grand and still have an equity of two hundred thousand dollars. So that's the way you want to look at it because of the cash flow. Right. So that's what I would do. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for the advice. I mean, I know like from what he's stated i don't know if he's really interested in seller financing he really kind of wants to have nothing to do with it it's kind of where his head is at um but i will definitely present it to him and see what he thinks yeah 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 i had i had a guy who 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 most people will feel the same way and so this is recorded and you can uh you can rewatch it but mo most people start at uh you know let's say 260 i want nothing to do with it just 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 pay me the money and I go on my way and you go on your way. So, but if you say, okay, what about 280? If you sell or finance, what about, and, and you don't, you don't, most people present an offer like, like, how about you, you sell or finance it to me or something like that? Well, that's, that's the wrong way to present it. The way to pitch it is like, okay, 260 is great. Can I have, some time to get the money would that be okay with you if if you give me some time so then the, that forces the question well how long do you need and then you say well will you give me a year <laughs> mm -hmm. and and a year is not unreasonable for a lot of people right but they will say well i was hoping i was hoping you know to have it sold you know within you know six months yeah, that's right. But the market, the way it is, things are sitting, sitting on the market for, for a long time right now. So if you, if you went and sold it through a real estate agent, the problem is going to be is that they can't sell it in 90 days anymore. So the property is going to sit there for almost as long as I'm asking you to, to give me so I can find the money. So I'm asking for a year. Are you okay with that? Well, I don't know. I was hoping, you know, to just be done with it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if they want to push you to do a cash deal, then, then the offer needs to be lower uh, because the, your ARV is at 340. Uh, and, and, and right now, which is one of the questions that I got on the group, what kind of ARV uh, percentage or 
we offering? Uh, and what you want to offer right now is 50 cents on the dollar. It, you know, so, so, so you get your ARV at 340, your offer needs to be at 170. So that's the offer. So he's losing a hundred grand just right. by taking cash. And if you do that, West Palm is going to be a little bit better than that. So you could, you could po probably get away with buying it at 200 probably, but that's too low for him, you right. know? And, and so, and so the way to pitch it, you would say something like, you, you know, Corey, you know, I, I can buy, you know, this house in multiple different ways. Cash is not a problem, but you're not going to like it. And it's going to be like super low. It's going to be my lowest. I can give you a lot more if you give me some time to find the money. And that's pretty much the pitch. Uh, so, um, so yeah, yeah. I think, I think that you can go in many different ways, especially because you have, you have a relationship. So let's do this. Why don't you go and just kind of have a conversation with him about mm -hmm. that specifically? And then you come back to me and I can help you kind of like uh, address concerns that he brings up and that sort of stuff. I'd be more than happy to do that. Okay. Sounds good. Um, the other component is um, I actually already did an inspection on it. Um, and there was... Um, the biggest thing was the roof and um they found like lead paint because it's an older okay. house okay. um and so i wasn't sure like how to move forward with that because i've i've heard so many different components to lead mm -hmm. paint like um don't do the deal because of that or you know just paint over it like i've heard so many different perspectives on it so i just want to hear what you want what you had to say if you ever experienced anything like that I have, I have, lead is a big issue because you, you have to sign a, a, a disclosure document uh, telling people that you have lead in the house. Mm -hmm. So that is an issue and it is pricey to, to, to deal with the lead and, and remove it. That right there would make your offer at 40 cents on the dollar. <laughs> so that will bring it down to, if, if he wants cash, that will bring it down to uh, probably a hundred thousand that should be your offer. Uh, uh, now, seller financing and creative financing and, and that route makes every deal easier from every perspective because when you transact a, a, a property and, and, and you buy it and you get, you get a bank involved, banks are the worst to, to deal with. The, the inspections are terrible. Then then, you know, they send an inspector and, and they're going to test for lead and all this kind of stuff. They can make, they can kill your deal. They can literally kill your deal. And then uh, I've dealt, I've sell, I've sold a lot of houses to, uh, you know, to, cause I was flipping, I used to flip a lot. And so I can't tell you how many times I dealt with banks and their little rules, you know, that they're made up, they're not part of the law, but they make it seem like they are part of the law. Like you're breaking the law if you don't fix something according to how they want it fixed. Right. Uh, so lead can be a problem. Uh, but uh, I mean, that's why I always just default to creative financing because that makes it easy. Uh, all you have to do uh, is just deal with the renter, what they're willing to accept. You have to disclose it as a landlord. You have to disclose it. That's for sure. You know, but they can be more lenient. Like if you're a renter, are you re and you don't have any place to live and this is a nice rental and so forth, are you really going to be that, that uh, difficult to deal with if there's lead in the house? Most people will say, okay, well, let's just kind of do the bare minimum to take care of it. Uh, but uh, that's not a question for me. That's a question for uh, somebody who, who repairs that type of stuff, who fixes that, because I don't know anything about how to fix it. What I did in the past is I hired a contractor to fix it for me and I paid I paid, um, oh man, I think it was like 15 grand, 15 grand to, to deal with it. Maybe more. I can't remember specifically. Um, cause when I flip, there's a lot of guys that flip and they do the work themselves, which is if you're flipping, that's what you should do, but you need equipment you need tools and so forth. Uh, but uh, what I did, the way I, I would flip is I would hire contractors to do all the work for me. And that gets expensive and it eats, eats away your, your profits. Gotcha. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, so here's what I would do as far as the lead. Uh, I would get on Google uh, and look for a um, uh, construction company, like a reputable construction company. Maybe the inspector can refer a couple mm -hmm. people, uh, ask him, how do I fix this? You know, what's the extent of the lead uh, uh, in the house, et cetera. And then try to get bids, try to get bids on that because just speculating, you can be all over the map, but if you know exactly how much it's going to cost you to fix that, uh, then, then that's a, a much better way to, to, to make a decision. Got it. Yeah. All right. That's a lot. If it, I'll keep <laughs> you posted. Um, um, we actually already, because like I mentioned before, because I hadn't really had much guidance about, you know, what to do. Um, we actually already signed a contract, but, um, oh, right now good. I'm in my, uh, but I did that because I didn't want him to, cause he kept threatening to get a realtor. And so I did that good for you. I didn't want him to get a realtor and mm -hmm. you know, at least they'll give me some time to ask questions to other people and get information. So I'm in my 15 day window where I can you know cancel the deal if i want to so this my idea is like when i reapproach him is you know bringing to him everything that i found on the inspection report and then you know asking him to reconsider with one of the seller financing options because i can still cancel the contract i can just you know say no i don't want it anymore but then we can just do a, another contract so you get what i'm saying mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah um how long is the contract for like how many days do you have to close? Um, I have, I have, uh, well, now I have 13 more days for to my, close. not to close, to do the, to do my inspecting. Like I, this is my window where I can yeah, cancel. Yeah, inspection. Yeah. Okay. Have you ran a title search? Uh, not yet. Okay. So I would say. I would say here's what you need to do. What you because I didn't know you had it under contract. Uh, do you have a title company? No. Not yet. Okay. Yeah. So that's the first thing. As soon as you as soon as you get 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 something under contract, you want to run that title like like ASAP. Uh, so you're in West Palm. Uh, so 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 get on Google. Here your 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 number one step is to find a title company. That's the number one step because they're backed up lately. And they need to run title. Now, do you have to pay for, for, for that? No, no. If you're closing with the title company, you don't pay until you close on the property. So you don't have to pay anything up front. Uh, so find a, a, a title company. The way to do it in West Palm is uh, go, go on, on Facebook and search for something relating to West Palm Beach uh, RIA, Real Estate Investor Association, and then call those guys and say, and say, hey, what title company do you guys recommend for wholesalers? Okay, in, in West Palm. And then you start or post it on their, on their group if they have a group, something like that. So find a title company, contact them, and then have them run this. Uh, it, they're also a great resource for contractors as well. So maybe you can ask them, who do you recommend uh, to deal with a lead problem in this property? And they'll give you a referral. That's the first thing you need to do, and you're 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 way behind on that. <laughs> That's for sure. You need you need to this you need to do that. To call me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, I know. So, uh, so that's the first step. Then, okay. uh, then the second step that you need to do is you need to go and. Uh, when did you say that probate is supposed to be uh, finalized? December sixteenth. December sixteenth. Um. You still have have uh, have time today is the seventh, so you, you you got time to do that. Uh, so so what you need to do also is call the city. Uh, mm -hmm. This is what I would do: call the city or call the tax collector, and then ask them where to go to find uh, city liens or or county liens. They should have a website where you can research that, so you can see if there's any debt against the property or any liens that the city has put on there uh, against the property so you can kind of kind of figure out because because the last thing you want to do is do all this work and then somebody 
you know, had IRS lien on the property for like 200 grand and that kills the deal. You can't buy it. You can't buy it. So the first thing you've got to know is that the 260,000 that they want is, is, is literally uh, doesn't have any liens, doesn't have anyone uh, uh, trying to take the house or anything like that. So that's what you got to do. Make sure that there, there's a, a free and clear title um, because then that allows you to, to go to work. You know, that allows you to go and figure out what you have to do. Uh, until then, you know, we're, we're just kind of like in limbo trying to figure out what to do. So, so right now we're, we're working under the assumption that it's got a free and clear title, but if it doesn't, then it will kill the deal. Now, if it does, let's say it's got a lien, then you go back to them and say, Hey, you got a hundred thousand dollar lien on this house. Uh, so that's, uh, that means that you have to you have to work with me here. You have to give me some seller financing. Uh, but like I said, I go back to seller financing because even if he if he does have that lien, and there's other problems or whatnot, seller financing cures all problems. Why? Because you just extend the life of the loan that he gives you. Right. So yeah, that's your first step. So I would do that and come back to me and let me know what you found out. Uh, also go on, um, go on, uh, I'll give you a resource here. Uh, let me see if I have it here. It's called American title and you can pull like a, like a soft title search. Uh, and it's called a debt stack. Where is it? Where do I have that? Um, I'll, I'll find it and, and send it to you and then post it also on the group. But uh, you, you basically pay $2.50 and then you get the debt stack. And that debt stack will allow you to, um, to see what's, what's, uh, if there's any liens or anything like that against the property. But that's, that's the most important thing. Uh, but but do, that, do have that conversation with him that uh, ask him, say, Hey, will you give me some time to get to come up with the money? I can find it and be confident that you can find it. You can find the money. Uh, that's no problem. But uh, also put it back on him that uh, he may have to give you some time. Uh, it may be one year, maybe three years. And that's fine. You just want to get him over past the one year mark. Okay. Because that works for you better. Yeah. All right, and welcome to everybody that's joined us here. I don't know if you noticed there, there's been people joining us. What questions do you guys have? Shoot. I'll go through the questions here on the group real quick. Okay, so we got a ton of uh, really great questions here. I, I have to listen. I can't listen to you. This is why I wanted you over there. <laughs> okay. Number one, uh, this is uh, uh, Reynold asked, is there something we can use to help us analyze deals? Yes, I use a, a tool called uh, Privy. Uh, it's it's um, uh, Privy is designed to to help investors uh, find areas where other investors are flipping, and so it it, it, it works from that premise. So uh, and it gives you estimates. So Privy is 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 cool. I like it. Uh, the other way to do it is uh, become an assistant to a local realtor and just say, hey, I, I want to work for you for free. <laughs> and, and then uh, it, it, and it's not like you're going to have a full time job. Just um, they'll give you like maybe an hour a, a week to do stuff for them. Uh, and, uh, and, and when you do that, they give you access to the MLS. That's what I do today because I'm not I'm not licensed. And so I don't do anything crazy with the MLS. All I do is I just look at the potential ARV. 
And that is free uh, because you're volunteering your time uh, to help uh, real estate agents, you know, put a listing up, change a description on their listings or something like that. So just become a, an assistant to a real estate agent is like the best way to analyze deals. Uh, if you have access to the MLS, I mean, there's nothing better than the MLS. Uh, additionally, I guess you can, uh, if you don't want to do any of that, you don't want to pay for privy. Uh, I guess uh, what you can do is get a membership to PropStream and to Batch Leads uh, and then average the two. Uh, I think that will give you also a really nice, um, a really nice, uh, uh, number for ARVs. Second question from Reynolds is, uh, how do you find cash buyers? Uh, <clears throat> cash buyers are sharks. You got to realize that. And, and, and they should be sharks. And they're very smart. And they're very clever people. They've been in the game for a long time. Uh, but uh, because they bring cash to the table, they have to buy cheap deals. So you have to find them cheap and sell them cheap. Uh, and in this market right now, what the problem is, is that you need to be at 50% uh, ARV most of the time on average. Some, of course, will be you can do 60%, 70% maybe, depending on the deal. But, um, you know, as, a, as an average, you're going to be at 50% or less. So um, of ARV minus repairs. So I'm talking 50%. Minus repairs, minus your wholesale fee, which will make it, you know, probably forty percent um, offer. So it's so it's 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 tough right now because those cash buyers want you to be to find deals with that kind of a discount. Uh, so if you are able to do that, cash buyers is not a problem. Where where people are running into issues right now in finding cash buyers is that they're still running their numbers at 70% ARV minus repairs minus wholesale fee. That's that when you have those deals in this environment, you're not going to find cash buyers as easily. Now, if you run with the 70% rule, uh, your flippers are not going to be your cash buyers as, as often. Uh, so what you have to do is find a better deal, a cheaper deal, or if you run with the 70% rule, then you find other types of buyers and that's going to be uh, people's uh, IRA. So, so you can sell and dispo your, uh, your properties to, to IRA investors. Uh, and how do you find them? Well, you go to RIAs, you go to RIAs and, and they're always looking for money uh, for, for uh, I mean, money's always looking for deals. So that's how you do it. Uh, you ask, um, you network with a lot of people to see who's got an IRA and who's buying properties inside of their IRAs because those guys typically will, because they're going for cash flow, they don't, they don't want to go and flip it. Uh, they will pay you still your 70% uh, your ARV minus repairs, uh, minus your wholesale fee. So I would focus on them. Uh, but if you're going after, um, you know, flippers and stuff like that and, and uh, hedge funds, they're going to want you to get super discounted deals, which is a lot harder in this environment. Uh, so just depending on, on the type of cash buyer that you want to find. Uh, number three question here is, what are some marketing strategies, I assume, to find deals? Um, that's a fantastic question. It's a loaded question. Uh, a lot of people out there on YouTube, they don't teach uh, anything but uh, direct to seller marketing. Uh, and, uh, and that's very hard because everybody focuses on that, which means, you know, you get a cold caller. And so you are actually looking, it's called outbound marketing. So you are, you know, texting. So you're, you know, outbounding, you know, text messages and calling, uh, and that type of stuff. But in the world of marketing, you have to do a two dimensional approach. You have to do um, outbound and inbound. Okay. And so, uh, those two have to be subdivided also into B2B and B2C. So most of the training out there on YouTube is only B2C, which is business us, you know, the wholesaler to consumer. So business to consumer, 
is very hard, very hard because it's really competitive. So if you want to set up a, a, a massive wholesale operation, uh, you have to think two dimensionally. You have to do B2C and B2B, business to business and business to consumer. And you have to do those two strategies simultaneously. So if you have you know, B2C cold calling, then you should also be approaching other businesses. Like how about roofers? Roofers you know, do a ton of marketing to find somebody who's got a problem with their roof. A lot of people uh, don't have insurance, <laughs> which you live in Florida. I don't know why you don't have insurance, but they don't. And so what means is what that means is if, if a tree falls on their house and they don't have insurance, you know, and they own it free and clear and they don't have money in the bank for the repairs, that property and that owner both became distressed. So they have a distressed house and they have a distressed owner because they can't pay for the repairs uh, and the roofer can't do the repairs because they can't pay him. So you approach a roofer and you say, hey, if you have this situation, send it to me. If I buy the deal, I'll give you a, a marketing fee. You can't do a commission, right? So don't ever say commission because we're not licensed, but you can give them a marketing fee. So that, that right there is, is, uh, is kind of like a little bit of an overview. You have to have uh, B2B marketing efforts and B2C marketing efforts. Uh, and that is the best way to do to 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 do um, uh, marketing strategy. B two C, in my opinion, is the hardest. B two B is the easiest. So approach contractors, approach uh, approach, of course, real estate agents, other wholesalers, uh, bio bio cleanup companies. Uh, think about it like if somebody who doesn't have any relatives. Uh, and who's uh, up in age, for example, uh, and somebody died in that house, bio cleaning companies will know about it and come and remove the body and that sort of stuff. And then relatives don't want to live in that house or keep it because their loved one died in the house. So that house needs to be sold. Okay. And so if you approach a bio cleaning company, uh, they will give you addresses where they've actually removed uh, deceased people from. So that is a fantastic free way to market and to get distressed properties that really uh, nobody really I see on YouTube talking about that kind of stuff. So think B2B first, then B2C second. Uh, is there a time sufficient way or time efficient way, I think, to find comps for a property. Uh, yeah, there's a time efficient way to, to find comps for a property. Uh, and that is going to be privy. Privy takes you about, um, I would say two minutes to find comps, two minutes max. And these are comps not based on market buyers, but these are comps based on uh, other flippers. Uh, let's see here. Lee asked, so I found this house that needs partial rehab from fire damage last year. Well, that's great. Lee, are you on here? Are you on the call? I think you were. Or Sarah, Sarah. Yes. Yeah, tell me about that. Tell me about that house. So the house has um, some minor repairs that need to be done. Hold on, I have notes here. Okay. Um, I have lots of notes from it, actually. So in, this in Jacksonville? Yes, it's in Jacksonville. It's partial repair from fire damage. That was back in April 2001. House is covered. Oh. It's dry inside. Um, main structure and kitchen still intact it has roof damage mostly um from what i have read all the new tile and windows have been bought for the house and will come with the house um the house sits on a three-quarter acre lot on a cul-de-sac uh, the arv uh 
could possibly be around maybe about $350,000 or more. I'm not exactly sure how to get. That's just my guess. Mm -hmm. What's the zip code? Um, the zip code is going to be 3222. 3222. Okay. Okay, go on. Um, it's a beautiful house. Um, it's a good neighborhood, quiet neighborhood. The neighborhood has an HOA. Um, it's a single, single family home. It was built in 2005. It has um, okay. electric heating, central air and cooling, a two car garage. It sits mm -hmm. on 220,000 2, square feet inside. Mm -hmm. It's a really nice house. Okay. And are you, have you contacted the sellers or the owners? I, I have not because I haven't, I haven't gotten that far yet. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know what to do as far as that goes yet because I'm not, I'm not confident in myself yet enough to do that. Sure. Sure. Um, yeah, those those are fantastic properties. Uh, fire damage properties, I would say, uh, that can give you an evergreen uh, source for uh, deals. So okay. if okay. if all you did was fire damage properties, you will build a big real estate business. <laughs> and if you just learn how to deal with them. Uh, and by the way, uh, if you guys are interested, I have a resource where uh, we can uh, we can find these uh, all over the state of Florida uh, uh, and in, in Georgia, I think, as well. So. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, I have a ton of fire damage properties in Jacksonville. That I need to work. So if you want, uh, uh, Sarah, we can uh, I can share that list with you and you can just kind of work them. Uh, and, uh, we can kind of JV on those if you want, but the way to do it is, uh, first of all, when you, when you initially get that lead, um, if you have already an ongoing operation, you can, you need to show up to the house like ASAP, uh, oh. and offer and property. offer the seller. Say again. I sat out in front of the property. I've looked at it. Um, like the house is boarded up, it's tarped up. Um, I have the list. So it was listed by a, a, a person. I have that person's phone number. Okay. I have the number. Um, I have so a real estate agent listed it on the market? Um, I have the, yes. Okay. I have all the information. I mean, I could share it with you personally. Sure. Um, sure. You if you could, if you want to give me um, a direct phone number where I could call you, um, I would be willing to do a JV with you with this um, for my first time. Um, if you want to, or if you want to walk me through how to do that, I just don't know how to do it. I don't know how to take mm -hmm. the steps in order to mm -hmm. do this. Mm -hmm. Let me, let's do this. Can you, um, can you send me a DM on, uh, on Facebook and send me the address? I won't disclose the, the address here on the call, but let okay. me just take a look at the property real quick because I can tell you better if I just look it up in public record. So yeah, go ahead and do that. Friends on Facebook. So I can do that. Yeah. Let me, let me just send you a message here real quick. Yeah. Cause I uh, think. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure why I can't. Um, you're not it'll friends. Be under, uh, it'll be the under the Lee Jackson. Okay. Got you. Okay. All right, so um, 
While she does that, I saw the next question that um, Reynolds had. It, it kind of plays off of this one, so I'll take on this one too. What are the main and important questions we should ask sellers? Well, the main question is, um, well, here's a problem. I'll, I'll just give you guys a, a shortcut. Uh, which is why Sarah's deal is is better than most deals. Is is uh, it's really hard to negotiate with sellers that live in the subject property because they need to find a place to live. Yeah, they'll sell it to you and they'll give you a good deal, but they have to move. <laughs> and so, in a in a seller's market like we had, you know, five months ago. The problem they had is that they could sell it for a reasonable enough price, but their proceeds wouldn't be enough to buy a house in an overinflated market. So a lot of people couldn't do the deal because they couldn't find a place for the owner to live. And now in, in, the, in the market that we have today, yeah, you can find a, a discounted deal now, but if the, if the seller still lives in the house, guess what? They have the same problem as well because, because now they have to go from a okay house to a cheaper house. Why? Because they don't make as much money uh, from the sale. So, so, so you always have an issue when you're dealing with owner-occupied homes and you have to be, you have to be super, super, super uh, good at your job. Not that you can't, but as a, as a beginner, you don't want to start with owner-occupied homes because they, they just require a lot of creativity that only time in, in real estate will teach you how to deal with. So I would say only start with absentee owners, so people who don't live in that house uh, or vacant houses, right? Uh, so, uh, so that's easy, which Sarah in this deal has, and uh, that's to answer your question, uh, Reynold. If you have a... Uh, a, a, a seller who doesn't live in the house, then it's a different conversation. So the questions you need to be asking them are co completely different from the questions you ask somebody who lives in the house. There are some exceptions to that, and that's going to be your pre-foreclosures, for example. Pre-foreclosures, they know they need to move, <laughs> and they know they're going to move uh, because the bank is going to, to kick them out. Uh, so, so that will be an exception. Uh, because you just come in and you make a deal uh, with them already knowing that they have to move. And all you have to do is pay for their, their moving expenses. And then you can get a deal that way. But, uh, but uh, aside from something like a pre-foreclosure, a foreclosure property, uh, focus on absentee owners, vacant houses. Basically, the owner doesn't live in the house and they don't have to find a place to move to. Uh, so that's going to be easy. So let me, I got your, uh, the address here. Let me look it up real quick. Okay. When you see the pictures, you'll be like, oh my God. <laughs> oh yeah, that looks really nice. So you are thinking the uh, the ARV is how much? Three hundred and fifty thousand. But I'm thinking that once the whole house is, you know, completely uh, rehabbed, I'm thinking it could be more because the house is just gorgeous. Yeah, it is it's beautiful. Let me look at the, the MLS. I have access to the MLS here. So uh, MLS says 343, probably, potentially. Um, okay. Batch lead says 396. So that tells you the difference. So that's why I like to have access to the MLS because if you're looking at batch leads, you would think, oh, my ARV could easily be at least 390, uh, but it's not. You look at the MLS and you're at 340. Um, 
Okay, let me look at a couple things here. So the first thing I'm doing, so I'm just going to walk you through what I'm doing, how I would do this deal, what I would do to get a hold of these guys. So I'm looking at the owner, uh, the owner's name on batch leads, and you need that. I mean, all of you guys, I mean, I don't work for batch leads, of course. Uh, you need either batch leads or prop stream because it's really easy to go in there, type the address, and you see who the owner is. Then the second thing I would do is I would copy the owner's name and then I would go into, and I will do this for free for you right now. The second tool that you need is you need uh, uh, a skip tracing tool. I personally use uh, this tool by uh, Max Maxwell called REI Skip. Yeah, and I'm, I'm doing this for you, so I'm going to send you the phone number. Okay. Uh, Is this um, something that I can purchase later on? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah, you can purchase at any time. Uh, okay. I'm doing this because it saves me time. Uh, the, the option you have for free is type the name and address on Google and then type something like people search or something like that afterwards so that Google can try to go and find a phone number. But this will save me, you know, probably about two hours of research by just typing it into REI skip. So if you don't have any money to buy this service, uh, then definitely use Google. Got you. Okay, I got him here. But for this one, I'm doing it for free for you. Because somebody wanted to get 400 bucks from you or something to even talk to yeah. you. <laughs> of course, unfortunately, I was desperate and sent him $100. Oh, man. Yeah. I got a phone number for you right here. You can call them. I actually have uh, I have an email address as well. I got uh -huh. uh, two email addresses and four phone numbers here. So I'm going to send this to you. Okay. Uh, and they still own it. Uh, so the name, the name is McCory somebody. So, okay. uh, so what do I do? I just call them and I don't like, <laughs> I don't just say that you were in the neighborhood cause you were, and you, you, uh, I actually uh, did it by accident, like completely by accident. Wow. Yeah, that's good. Th those are the best leads because you don't have a lot of competition. So I guess a, 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 um, a list or a question that should, should be asked in this group would be like, what is the best lead uh, or, or list to pull? And that list is going to be driving for dollars because it's unique to you. That's yeah, the that's reason why. Do a lot is driving for dollars. Um, mm -hmm. And that was, uh, that's actually what I was doing was driving for dollars. And I actually ended up taking a wrong turn down this street and ended up on this cul-de-sac and bam, found this house and was like, oh, what is this? Yeah. 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 Uh, driving for dollars. Another activity. Uh, and that's what I would do uh, if I was was starting out i would do of course i don't know if you heard what i was saying earlier about uh, b2b and b2c i would call businesses that serve homeowners think about that what businesses out there serve houses you know pool contractors i mean lawn care people uh board up houses who who calls board up companies that's going to be absentee owners you know what i mean so Spend your time. A lot of people say, oh, you got a cold call. You got a cold call. You got to pull a list and cold call. I would say that's the wrong approach, man, because you're going to spend a ton of money uh, without really making a whole lot of progress. What I would do instead is go ahead and call businesses that, that deal with situations, as I explained. And then the second thing I would do is I would drive for dollars. I would, I would farm a neighborhood. So instead of... Uh, focusing on a list, I would focus on a neighborhood where there's uh, potential for rentals and, and just focus on that neighborhood 
and walk the streets because if you're only driving, people say driving for dollars is great and it is, but walking for dollars or, or biking, you know, you get a bicycle and just go down up and down the streets. If you do that, you notice things that you wouldn't notice if you're in a car. Okay. And you hear the noises of the neighborhood because if you're driving for dollars, you, you, you're probably listening to music in the car or whatever. But if you're walking, you're noticing a lot more detail. Uh, I used to walk for dollars a lot. And when I was doing a rehab, uh, I'll, I'll tell you a story real quick. I was doing a rehab in Jacksonville. This is in, in uh, uh, near, uh, this is uh, 103rd and Blanding. 103rd and Blanding. I was doing a, a, a flip in the neighborhood. And, uh, and, I, and I stepped outside to do something and and i started walking around you know just to kind of see look through windows uh you know of vacant properties and then i found this other property it looked really nice and then i look inside and the carpet had been removed and everything else and i'm like oh man somebody's trying to flip this i looked it up like i did this house here and then i called the owner and the owner picked up and she's like oh yeah we were trying to flip that house two years ago i'm like two years ago why haven't you flipped it well, we got divorced, me and my husband. He owns the house next to it. <laughs> and, I said, and I said, wow, is he trying to sell? And she's like, I don't know. Are you trying to sell? And she goes, uh, I, I might be able to be convinced. And uh, anyway, we did a deal. I bought it for 50 grand. Uh, and the flip, I flipped it for 240 so that was a really nice flip. And that came from walking for dollars, not driving for dollars. Because I had driven down that street so many times because I, I was flipping that house. And I never noticed that house. But if I'm walking, man, I notice everything. Uh, I ended up doing three houses in that neighborhood because I walked the streets. So if you do that, you'll find a ton of deals. Let me, I'm going to give you a PDF with all the information for this seller. And what I want you to do is call the seller, uh, call all the numbers, and here's what you say. You say, hey, I was in the neighborhood and uh, I noticed uh, your house. And I wanted to know what you were planning on doing with that blue tarp on top. <laughs> and that's all you say. And get them to talk. The, the key being on the phones is to find little things to get people to talk. And if you do that, they'll tell you everything you need to know. And then based on the information that you, that you gather, then you can, you can uh, figure out what's going on. Now, the worst thing, to go back to Reynolds' question, what do you say to sellers? Now, the worst thing you can do is be calling around and, tell, and asking people if they want to sell their house. Don't ever do that. I know people teach that, but don't, don't do that. That is terrible. Why? Because everybody's doing it. So you just kind of find friends, make connections, have conversations, like have real conversations with people. That will be akin to what you were saying, Sarah. People are charging, hey, in order for me to teach you anything, uh, you got to send me some money. Right, right, right. Don't, don't do that. You know, if you're a coach, you provide value, which is what I'm doing right now. I'm not charging you anything for it. And I'm telling you exactly what to do. Right. Like, so, like um, I said, there's plenty of money out there to be made. Like, why would you take from somebody who's just starting out and trying to learn something? Like, that's right. I'm pretty sure that when he started out, nobody charged him. That's right. Like, there's, there's so much. There's so much out there to be made. A ton. We There's a ton of money. Together. We can That's all right. eat together. That's it. That's it. Um, let me just send this to you. Um, how do I attach? Okay. So once I get this person to talking and mm -hmm. I find out if they tell me, yeah, um, so I just, I just want to get rid of the house. I want to find somebody, you know, who wants to 
buy it and fix it, you know, or I just want I just want to sell it. I just want to get rid of it. I just want to sell it. Where do I go from there? Oh, that's uh, that's everything right, right there. You can go in many different directions. Let me uh, also address what the job of a real estate investor is. As a real estate investor, you don't want to start with wholesaling in mind. Uh, right. Wholesaling is a byproduct of a lot of marketing, uh, but wholesaling is not a strategy. <laughs> it's not, it, in order for you to have a wholesale business uh, and just create it as a, like be a wholesale investor, uh, you have to do at least 20 deals a, a month consistently because because then you're going to pay a lot of capital gain tax. And that's another thing that most people on, uh, on YouTube, like you're watching videos and you're like, oh, I want to get into wholesaling. I want to get into investing and, and that sort of stuff. Nobody talks about the tax implications of that stuff. And you got to pay a lot of capital gain tax if you are wholesaling, uh, if, if you're flipping um, 20, uh, above 20%. Uh, in all instances. Uh, so, so you can't start your journey of in, in real estate by paying a lot of tax. What you want to do is think like an investor. You need to think like an investor because you'll identify deals. Even if you end up wholesaling them, you know what a good deal looks like if you kind of think like an investor. If you think like a wholesaler, uh, everybody complains about wholesalers because I'm a buying hold investor. Okay. So, but our biggest complaint for wholesalers is that their, their, uh, their, their ARV is always, always, in every instance, off, always, especially new wholesalers. And it's, it's not off because the property is worth more than the estimated ARV by the wholesaler. It's, it's typically, you know, the ARV is way too ambitious. And then also what wholesalers do is the cost of repair is always 20 grand, right? It's always very small. Uh, and that's not true. So wholesalers get a bad reputation because they want to make a deal work and they're underestimating every bit of information that as a buying hold investor you need. So everything is always fantastic. This house is going to sell quickly or whatever. And it's going to sell for, you know, 300,000 above ARV or something crazy like that. And you need only five grand to go into it. That's, that, that, that's not true. So, so you want to think like an investor because you want to run very, very good numbers on every property. So, so, what you want to do is you want to start getting good at analyzing deals. Uh, and the best way to do that is to start with cash flow. So go on Zillow. So I'm going to pull up your house on Zillow and I'm going to give you an example. So go on Zillow and type, um, let me see, once it loads, go on Zillow and then go on Rentometer or rental meter and then figure out what the rent is so there are two ways to figure out what something is worth number one way which is what every wholesaler does is they want to figure out the arv right but that's the first way the second way is you want to figure out what the rent is going to be and the rent is what's important to a buy and hold investor not the arv the ARV is important to a flipper, but not to a buy and hold investor. So if you're going to wholesale, what you want to do is you want to figure out who your customer is. And your customer is your buyer. Uh, your property sold in 2021, 702-2021. So, um, and there's really nice pictures on Zillow. Okay. So let's take this as an example. By the way, the pictures and what I'm seeing on Zillow makes makes this a no go. Okay, not a. Not, I wouldn't spend a whole lot of time on this deal. I would just call them with a lot of uh, a lot of doubt that it it will work out because it just sold. Somebody bought it like this. 
And how, how do I know that is because I'm looking at the picture. Somebody listed this for sale and somebody bought it as a distressed home. So it was probably an investor already purchased the, the home. But let's, let's kind of walk with the example. So the house, this estimate is 347. And the estimated refi payment is 1,028, which makes me think their mortgage payment is uh, below that or should be below that, below 1,000. So now Zillow typically offers you a rent estimate, but in this instance, it doesn't. So what I have to do is I have to go to a uh, rentometer and figure out how much rent this will generate. And so it's a 3 2, which is great. Okay, let me see. Okay, fantastic. Uh, the rent can be at least, at least 1964 a month, which will give you, if your payment is below thousand dollars which i think it would be in this property then you can cash flow this by about a thousand bucks that right there is what's attractive to an investor is the cash flow not the arv the arv like i said it's only important to flippers but not to buy and hold investors so if i were you guys i would become a wholesaler that only wholesales to buy and hold investors that's it because they're you're looking for cash flow and you're doing that work for them so Zillow provides you with uh, a lot of neat estimated payments. So if you scroll down on Zillow, uh, you pull up the, the house, it will tell you if they, there's an HOA. The HOA here is 385. That comes off of the payment. So now your cash flow went from $1,000 to 400 and no 500 and um uh say 500 bucks because you gotta estimate the the um the property management fee so you are at 500 cash flow uh let's see if it includes property taxes and uh, insurance it does it does so so you can cash flow this property right here for 500 bucks a month. And that is attractive to an investor. Very attractive in Jacksonville all day, all day. People will buy that. Uh, any questions on that, uh, Sarah? So is, would this be something good to move forward with or no? The rule of thumb follow up with everybody follow up with everybody even like i'm telling you here i have my initial gut feel is that so, an investor purchased it uh or uh somebody who wants to flip it purchased it repair it and my initial gut feel is i'm not gonna get a deal however we are in the business of finding two things only two things deals and dollars so if you call this person and he is in fact an investor then he bought this house to be a buying hold investor so he's a cash buyer <laughs> so make the call make the call okay. and like i said you know just talk to them because you don't know if you if you're like if your pitch is like hey w will you sell this house Oh, yeah, of course. Everything is for sale for the right price. Of right, course. Right. <laughs> but that's not what we want. What we want is to figure out what the situation is. So, yeah, I would definitely call. But I would think that I'm going to talk to an investor. I'll be prepared to talk to an investor. Right. So this would be my actual first, my first call. So. Great. I wouldn't Great. know what the right things to say or not. Okay, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, a lot of new people uh, are very scared because they think that they need a uh, some sort of uh, knowledge or education or something. 
Uh, but that actually can be uh, not as important as you think. Uh, but if, if you call somebody and you are, you are honest uh, about where you are and what you're trying to do, that will take you a lot farther than trying to sound like you know what you're doing. Uh, so as an example, if I'm new, if I haven't done a deal in the past and I'm calling this guy and I'm saying, hey, uh, I saw your house. I was actually in the neighborhood, like literally in the neighborhood. Uh, and I saw this house and I've been interested in investing in real estate. And I thought maybe I can start with this house. Just tell him exactly what you're telling me. Right. See what he says, because I'm, I can almost guarantee you. Are you still there? Are you still there? Okay. I'm sorry. I don't know what happened there to my internet. You guys still here? I'm still here. Okay. Great. Great. Kind of got a little so bird. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, that's what I would do you guys. Uh, it, and that goes back to the core of the reason why I made this group, because, uh, as an investor, you're always looking to, to, um, to add people to your team. Uh, into network with people. Uh, real estate is a team sport. Uh, nobody can do real estate by themselves. Nobody. I don't care who you are. You can't. You need a team. You need, you need to work with people. You need a title company. You need inspectors. You need, uh, you need a cold caller. You need uh, you know, B2B referrals. I mean, you name it. It's a team sport. So that's the purpose of this group is I want to create it so that we can network and, and, and kind of like um, talk about deals and, and uh, share experiences and stuff like that. And ultimately, that will give us deals to do together. Uh, and you guys have, uh, have really good deals that you're finding. You know how to identify them. So that, that's great. Roseanne has a fantastic deal right now. So, so that's, uh, that's good. Uh, any questions? I think you answered all my questions for now. <laughs> good, good. I'm happy, happy to hear that. You know, it was all for free. It didn't cost you anything. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Okay, let me see what questions we have here uh, that I have not answered. Uh, got that. Uh, yeah, you also asked that. What should we ask? That is a that is a big question. It always changes, uh, but the last thing you want to do is never ask if if somebody would uh, would sell their house. So if you're calling pre foreclosures, uh, I'm going to give you like a super tip. If you're calling pre foreclosures, just kind of tell them if they're um, 
if if they will let you uh, take care of the the back payments they owe the bank, and that will keep them on the phone. Believe me, and you can because when you buy the property, you will take care of those payments. You can't buy it any other way. But you will keep them on the phone. The worst thing you can do with pre foreclosures is call them and say, uh, ask them if 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 they'll sell the house because they don't want to hear that they're scared their their credit is going to be ruined they don't know where they're going to live etc so so it just depends on the list if you're calling uh probates uh you don't want to ask if they want to sell the house either you want to kind of ask them if um if if they need uh money to pay for the probate or something like that so, so you you got to be really, really uh, cognizant of uh, of what they're going through when you call and you say, "Hey, will you sell me your house?" That that shows selfishness. That's all it shows, and you sound like a marketer. But if you're calling to give value, then that changes the whole the whole game, and you don't have to call as many people. Uh, so. It'd be great if you can explain why selling a house in the hood with a 170K ARV for 110 that needs full rehab, the numbers simply don't work. Well, because uh, 110, let me see if I understand this correctly. Selling a house in the hood. Yeah, because um, if if it needs full rehab, I mean, you you think cost of the lumber and stuff. So it needs. If you're going to to put heavy heavy uh, work into a house, uh, and let's say it will cost you 50% of what it would cost to, to build a house, uh, then you're paying for a lot of materials. And so you gotta, you gotta, you gotta go above 170 K because if you call a contractor and ask them how, how much will it take to build a house at three, two, then you're right now in this environment, I think a contractor can do it for, Hundred and hundred and fifty minimum to two hundred thousand, because of the cost of the material and their fee. So, but they won't sell it for one hundred and fifty to to two hundred. They'll sell it for three fifty. So, if if you're doing a, a full rehab and your ARV is one seventy, uh, off the bat you you need to allow some cushion in your ARV. So if it's 170, I'm not looking at 170. I'm looking at one, uh, 150 because you want to be conservative with your numbers. ARV is always overinflated most of the time, as I was explaining uh, earlier. So if somebody tells me ARV is 170, I default to no, it's not. If you say it's 170, it's probably 150. And more likely, I got to be a 140 ARV, right? And so from there, then I multiply that by 70% if we're, if we're doing a wholesale deal, right? And I immediately can tell by those figures that, uh, that um, I'm going to be at probably 80 grand. It's only because people want to be conservative. That's why. That's why you may have issues finding somebody that agree with your, with your numbers. Uh, the question continues on and says uh, 1500 a month payment is tough for a buyer to pay in the hood and DSCR loans for landlords are 9% won't cash flow either. Yeah, that's right. This is one of several reasons 50% of wholesale, wholesaler contracts never close. Yeah, but it goes back to what I was saying earlier that you just kind of have to find a better buyer. And the, and the buyers that will work in any market are the, uh, 
the people who are investing out of their, their IRAs. That typically always fixes your problem with the buyers. So you got to find a buy and hold investor who wants to buy inside of their, their IRA and they don't really care about the ARV. If you tell them 170, they'll say, okay. <laughs> so that's why you want to buy them because they don't, they don't care. They want to be in the market for the next you know, 20 years. So if you say 170, they're looking at 20 years from today, they can take that property from 170 to perhaps uh, the value in 20 years is going to be at least $300,000. That's why they'll say okay to your 170 because they don't care. Versus a flipper uh, that will tell you exactly what I said is not 170, it's 150, right? So, so know who your customer is. Your customer is the person that's bringing the money into a, to a deal. So that can be your buyer or it can be your lender. So, so in both, uh, can invest from their IRA to become your buyer and become your lender if you want to buy and hold it. So, so your customer, your customer will always be the person with the with the with the 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 cash. That's that's your that's your customer. Uh, the seller is not your customer. The seller is never your customer. Why? Because you buy that property one time, and you'll never see them again. Now, they can become your customer if you pay cash for that property and you convince them to invest that money right back into your business as a lender. Now they become your customer. But the seller is not your customer uh, if you do a transaction. Your customer is the lender, is the buyer, and is the B2B businesses that send you leads. Those are your customers in real estate. So I hope that's clear. So biggest lesson in business is know your customer. Okay, should we stick to 70% and 80% rule or go lower? I explained that earlier. Uh, you got to be at 50% in this environment. Uh, how can I find the owner of vacant land, Sarah? Um, yeah, same way. Uh, you. Um, you buy um, uh, batch leads, type in the, uh, the address on there, and uh, it, it will tell you, or prop stream. Uh, if you don't want to put money into buying those services, uh, figure out uh, which county the property is in, and then you go into public record. You go into the property appraiser's website. You type that address on the property appraiser's website. And it will tell you the name of the owner. And that is free. You don't need to, to pay for that service. Can you buy buildings that say for lease? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you can. It's, it's uh, most people pay, play in the, uh, in the housing game. Commercial is the Rolls Royce of real estate because in commercial, you do one deal a year and you are like way ahead of most investors because uh, you can approach somebody that has a building for lease and say, hey, will you, uh, are you open to doing a lease with an option to buy? And so you just call all the, uh, all the buildings that have that sign and ask that question. Um, and so with in commercial, you're finding a lot of investors. They're not homeowners. Uh, so they're investors already. So you can talk to them about more advanced strategies and, and, and more advanced uh, jargon in real estate. And to them, you can pitch them or you can ask them if they're open to selling. Homeowners, it's difficult because you'll turn them off. Uh, but commercial investors, they, they know the game. Uh, they probably started, in, started in, uh, in wholesaling. Who knows? But they know the game. And so you call them and you say, hey, um, are you open to, to, uh, to leasing with an option to buy? And you just make that call to every, every sign that you see. But the problem you're going to have is that 
most of those phone numbers you'll see, they go to, to a real estate agent or they'll go to like a, uh, some type of uh, management company or something. So you won't get the owner. So what you have to do is go and skip trace the owner and call them and ask them. So that's what you have to do. Is residential easier than commercial? No. And is commercial easier than residential? And the answer is no. <laughs> because uh, commercial requires you become a student of real estate uh, and because you're going to interact with a bunch of sharks. They know the game. They know what they're doing. They've been doing it for a long time. So you just have to educate yourself. Everything boils down to education. You have to speak the language that they speak so, yet, so that you can understand them. When they tell you NOI, you, know, you, you want to know exactly what they mean by NOI, right? Because some people like say Grand Cardone will tell you something like NOI is garbage. <laughs> but then most of the people out there that own these buildings live only based on the NOI, right? So, um, so it just depends. Uh, there's super advanced commercial investors, and then there's people who just have been playing the game of Monopoly in real life. Uh, and to them, NOI is 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 great, right? So, so you have to understand what they mean when they say terms like that. Uh, let's see if there's any other questions. I guess the, uh, the question there, Sarah, should be, what should you start with? And I would say is whatever, whatever you're comfortable with, whatever you think is, is, is an activity that you're going to love. Uh, and uh, if you focus on, 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 don't focus. I know that we all try to make money in real estate and stuff, but if you're just trying to do that, you'll come across uh, wrong to to potential sellers. Just play the game because it's fun. Uh, that would be like my biggest advice. Is like because it's fun, uh, because you can make money uh, for people, and then lastly is because you can make money. So focus on making money for people first, which is what I'm doing here. So I practice what I preach. And then they'll begin to trust you and they'll bring you deals or they'll bring you opportunities or you guys can join in the deals that I'm doing so you can see what I'm doing and how to structure a deal and that type of stuff. So the key here is just networking all the time. Um, so do I like commercial better than residential? Yes, I do. I, I like commercial better. Uh, I sold a restaurant one time uh, in uh, 103rd, Sarah, 103rd and in, 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 uh, and um, uh, 95, no, is it 295? What's the loop in Jacksonville, 295? I think it is. So it's in the west side. I bought that deal. I bought it from somebody who, you know, just was very, very desperate. Uh, I bought it for 11 grand and, and uh, or 14 grand, something like that. It was a restaurant. Uh, it was boarded up and everything else. I saw it. I was driving for dollars and I saw it and, and, and I did exactly what you did. I went, I researched it. I called the guy and uh, he says, oh, I hate that building. I think his dad owned it or something. And, and I said, I'll give you cash for it. And he says, he says, he says, OK, uh, if you if you give me 20 grand, I'll sell it to you. I said, no, I can't do 20 grand. But I'll give you, I'll give you uh, 11 or 10, something like that. And he says, let's do 14 and you got a deal. So I bought it. Then I listed it on loopnet.com. Uh, it was a restaurant, which is very difficult from a uh, uh, perspective of uh, only doing houses because you don't have ARVs like you have with uh, residential. So what I ended up doing was uh, I put it on loopnet and I put it on there for like 300 grand and I ended up selling that thing for uh 200 and something so I made like almost a quarter million just in one transaction so I love commercial because you do the deals that you do are bigger they're bigger margins bigger profits bigger everything 
Uh, and so I love that. Uh, houses, you're making, you know, 5,000, 10,000 assignment fees and so forth. Uh, and by the way, that restaurant uh, I bought with none of my own money. What I did is I called my real estate agent and I said, and I said, hey, I'm buying this restaurant. What do you think? And she said, oh, there's a lot of traffic. It's 103rd in Jacksonville uh, going west. So it's westbound. And, uh, and she goes, I, I would buy it. How much is it? And I said, it's, it's 14 grand. And she goes, I would buy it. I said, okay, do you have 15 grand that I can borrow <laughs> to buy it? And she said, are you serious? I'm like, I'm totally dead serious. And she goes, yeah, I do. Depending on what you want to pay me. Uh, I said, well, you, you name it, you tell me. She's like, okay, I'll give you 15 grand. And if you have my money back, within six months, I want 20 grand back. I said, you got a deal. So I did, I borrowed 15 grand and uh, I paid her, I paid her 25. So she told me 20, but I gave her 25 because I made, I made over 200,000. So I was able to do that. Uh, and I did that with none of my own money. Uh, and uh, we did it in like 90 days. Uh, so that was a commercial deal. You can see it today. Uh, it's on 103rd, right next to a McDonald's. I actually ended up regretting that deal. I should have bought it and kept it because I sold it to a hedge fund that uh, estimated the value of that building to be $2.3 million. So, but I was very, very naive at the time when it came to restaurants that I didn't know how to guesstimate that, uh, that ARV, right? So uh, you live and learn. Any questions from funny, anyone else about that? Funny that you say that because I just found a um, restaurant on 103rd the other day that is boarded up. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, there's a, there's a ton of activity there on 103rd. There's actually a few, quite a few restaurants that are vacant and being used at the moment on 103rd. Like I've put it been together. doing a lot of research. Yep. So yeah, put it together and let's call them. Do I'm in Miami live? right now. Oh, you're in Miami. I was gonna say because mm -hmm. um or, well I have you on uh Messenger. I like I like I said, I'm willing to do uh J V with you if that's what you would like to do. Um to get a yeah, a yeah, of, definitely. You know, I'm yeah, I'm here to JV with you guys to kind of teach you. I'm not a, a coach. I'm not a guru. I'm not a teacher. I am just somebody who is always looking for deals and looking to partner up with a lot of people because uh, that's, that's what makes money. I will definitely, I am willing to partner up. I'm willing to do a JV or even a couple of them just to get my foot in the door, learn how this works so that I can get with what I'm doing I'm a hands-on mm -hmm. person that's how I learn I can't mm -hmm. learn by telling me hey do this that and the third no I have to see it and do it in order to learn how to do it yeah yeah that, that's how I am hey, too most people hey Ben hey Ben this yeah. is Tyrell hey how you doing bro good can you hear me okay yeah yeah definitely okay yeah so um I uh I have I've done a few deals here in Jacksonville I just recently um sold a house over in Bartram area. If you're, I don't know if you're familiar oh, with that. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm, right now, I, uh, I'm about, about to close on a piece of land right downtown by the, uh, right next Sweet. to the Jaguar Stadium off of Swift Street. Sweet. Um, so I'm trying to, I'm trying to wholesale that one. Um, I got it under contract for 25. It's, it's about 5,000, no, it's, it's 4,000 square feet, mm -hmm. uh, vacant land. And I'm trying to, so I'm trying to flip land a little bit right now too. And I, and I also, um, I work with a team. So I have a team of like, I have real, real estate agents. I have, um, a contractor superintendent that goes and checks out all the properties, uh, you know, that we're, that we're interested in once we get access. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm interested in doing deals as well. Um, and Sweet. I do have, you know, the infrastructure to, you know, check stuff out. If you with you, I know yeah. you, you in Miami. What kind of stuff are you buying? Right now? Uh, we 
I, I focus right now. What, what I do right now is I'm just growing my network of, uh, like I was telling you guys, IRA investors. Uh, so, cause, uh, IRA people, they're long-term, like I was explaining and, uh, and they'll buy, uh, things for market price. So, so, so pretty much anything that I can get in their hands, commercial, residential, even, even M and A, uh, uh, which is buying businesses and stuff like that. So we do a lot of stuff. So, so they're my clients and my job is to just find them investment opportunities. So I look at anything. I look at land. I look at commercial. I look at uh, residential. Um, I look at um, uh, even uh, new construction. Whatever makes sense, I'm willing to look at. I'm willing to look at. Okay. And uh, and you can also network with uh, with Sarah. You know, t- she can she can be a resource to you. Hi, Sarah, uh, nice to you, meet you. Yeah. Yeah, that's the point of Me this. It's like uh, oh, this network. Hi, Roseanne. Hi, Roseanne. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> yeah, I want you guys to like uh, to network and and uh, let's start uh, working together instead of uh, everybody trying to like uh, do things on their own and start, you know. And like yeah. uh, Tyrell, you remember what it was like when when you started, you know. So you just needed a little a bit of uh, somebody to, to, to sort of show you a couple of things and then you took off. So I'm well, glad. I, I'll say for me, a lot of it was getting out of my own way and trusting that I, that I, when I looked at the deal and I, and I did all the ARVs and I did it over and over and over and over again, mm-hmm. just actually trusting yourself um, to yeah. do the deal and to yeah. do what you, know you have to do. Um, and I think that's the biggest part is just the confidence. You're never, nobody's ever going to give you the green light you're looking for to, just do the deal. Is that, yeah, yeah, that's You're right. You're not going right. to find it. So yeah, you just have yeah. to do it. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's right. A property I'm looking at in front of me, it's an old bank that is run down, not being used. A property right behind me is a, a huge parking lot um, that's just sitting there. And right next to me, I believe, is an old Wendy's. It is uh, vacant. Like there's properties. So- me right now as we speak that I'm just looking at them and I'm like all I see is dollar signs but I don't know how to go and get it that's my problem yeah what would you say there Tyrell um I would just say first you need to figure out kind of what you're you know what what you're honing in on I would just hone in on a specific like so if you it's really kind of finding because you're really finding if you're going to wholesale stuff, you're really finding it for people who are going to buy it. So you have mm-hmm. to look at stuff. You have to look at stuff with the with the idea in mind is who's going to be your end buyer. Right. Yeah. So I had to I had to pull out of a deal recently. Um, this was probably two weeks ago. I was uh, under contract on the house over off the South Side Boulevard. Um, it was on Sandusky Avenue. So. It was a uh, it was a duplex. It was a two. It was one side of a duplex, two bedroom, one bath. It wasn't in terrible shape, um, but what we had planned to do with it, we got we felt we got a really good number on it based off of the ARVs in the area. And so, um, you know, we were doing our due diligence. We had you know our contractors come out, give us bids on everything, and um, we ended up we were on the seventh day of our inspection where we would have lost our. Um, would have lost our, our binder deposit. And it turns out that we didn't think we had to replace the roof because there was nothing really wrong with it, right? But it was mm. 17 years old and we had planned to sell the property. We got it under contract for 135. We were probably gonna have to put about 20, maybe, no, we were actually gonna put around 13 to 15 grand in it. So it was kind of a cosmetic flip. Mm. And we had planned to put it back on the market for um, around 220 to 225 in that area. And so our buyer at that price point is no more than likely going to be FHA, um, VA. Um, and so it turns out mm-hmm. that we would have had to we would have had to replace that roof because it was 17 years old. It would not have qualified for FHA. That's right. That's would right. Would not have qualified for VA. So we we didn't, and that's one of the things that kind of I think slipped through the cracks with with uh, with my contractor. And you know. It's something that I should have known as well, but you know, you're looking at a million different other things. Mm-hmm. Um, and so luckily that we did kind of figure that out and we were like, no, you know, this isn't the deal for us because we're going to have to put another 10 grand into the deal just to do the roof. 
and it just it just didn't make sense um at that point for us so um but that was a, that's a deal and we couldn't wholesale the deal because there was a no assignment clause so yeah we had to close on it or we had to walk away so um just kind of there's just stuff there's stuff that's going to come up but you have mm -hmm. to you have to kind of hone in on what's going to be your wheelhouse for right now um and you can always move on to other stuff so um for me right now, um, I'm really focused on wholesaling and really doing the due diligence for my end buyer, you know, with my contractor, we're going to get you a mm -hmm. solid number on a, on a flip and yeah. uh, as far as a rehab. And so, and then even if you can't be here physically to do the rehab and you're like, okay, well, can we, can I just have your team go and do the rehab for me? You know, you mm -hmm. guys have already priced it all out, um, you know, and do it that way. So you just kind of have to find kind of create value for people, right. For your, uh, yeah. for your end buyers, create value. I think that's the biggest thing is what are you willing to do? Um, you know, to create value for people who are ultimately going to buy your deals. Yeah. I yeah. Know, that know your a, customer. That was, a, that was a mouthful. Sorry guys. No, you're good, so, brother. That's a, that's a whole lot. That's how, a whole Tyrell, lot of wisdom. How brother. You, Tyrell, how are you finding your end buyers? Um, so, uh, basically what I, what I do is, as I work, um, my ex, my ex is a real estate agent. So, um, I'm more so trying to use her network to figure out, I use realtors a lot because I, I, I wholesale a lot off of the MLS. And so mm -hmm. you can find a lot of M buyers by using realtors. You can find them by in these, in these wholesale, these real estate wholesale groups, you can find end buyers. Mm -hmm. You can just, it's a lot of it is just telling people what you do. Because you never know if you'll you bump into an end buyer, you know, That's just right. by them not even knowing what you do. So That's right. it's really just your network is your net worth, right? So That's just continue it. networking. And yeah. that's how you find people. Yeah. What we are doing right now is how you do everything. This is how you find deals, this is how you find buyers, this is how you find lenders. It's pretty much it. It's not like uh because uh, real estate is a team sport, and so you need people to find the like the network. And the net worth, like Tyrell was saying, uh, and so when you're when you're thinking that there's like a kind of like works like off of a list or something, uh, some things do, but most of it doesn't. I mean, uh, I had at the time uh, when I was flipping in Jacksonville, I had six realtors that I was working with, and they were getting me deals and they were selling my deals. So it really is just you just put yourself in between the deal. You're just you're just looking for opportunities and how you can pretty much make it work. Uh, so so yeah, I agree with you, brother, a hundred percent. You build a network and your net worth automatically like increases. I uh, I went to a, a, a seminar out in Vegas. I don't know if you're familiar with Future Flipper and uh, Brian Brian Pineda. Um, oh yeah 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 yeah. 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 I like uh, him. Yeah, I went to uh, their, their real estate, kind of their three-day seminar, uh, mm -hmm. and I met a lot of people who were doing wholesale deals in Jacksonville virtually from Hawaii, from uh, mm -hmm. Sacramento. I mean, everyone really loves the Jacksonville market, so I think there's a lot of buyers. That's right. If you just broaden yeah. your horizons, they're not, sometimes they're not even in Florida. That's um, right. So, That's right. Yeah. Yeah. The end game, though... Um, I was doing a ton of deals and, and everything and, uh, and you can do it and you can build a solid business. Uh, but your end game has to always be present. You have to figure out what you want out of life. <laughs> Pretty much you need to be focused and say, how is real estate going to help me get to where I want to be? And, and you have to have a goal that is, that is adequate for you. <laughs> uh, I'm not saying realistic. I'm not saying, you know, too big, too small, you need to figure out exactly what you want. Uh, and then, and then build real estate, uh, as a way to get you there. Uh, for me, for me, I had to figure out how to disconnect myself from wholesaling and from flipping. Uh, and I did that three years ago. So I slowed down all of my flipping, all of my wholesaling, and I just focused on building wealth. And because you can build a ton of wealth with, like, for example, the restaurant example I gave you guys, if I had kept that property, what I should have done was I should have uh, partnered with, uh, let me say it a different way. Uh, 
and you guys asking how you find your buyers, right? There are a lot of ways to find buyers. So you have to figure out who your buyer is and then figure out what they want. So you're reverse engineering your wholesaling and investing career. In my case, is I, I, I try to figure out who is the best buyer, who's the best customer. And so I went through a tra transition where I figured out, well, okay, my customer should be probably the tenant because a tenant is going to stay in my property for a long time. Uh, they're going to pay down my mortgage. They're going to generate my cash flow. So I'm like, okay, so now that I narrowed everything down to the tenant is my number one customer, then, then, then I had to figure out who that tenant was. And you have several choices. In my mind, I only had two choices. That was going to be a, a, just a average person as my tenant, right? That I can put inside a house or, and that's one of the transitions I'm going uh, through right now is, you know what? I think there's a much better tenant. And so I kept climbing this ladder to find better tenants. And where I'm at now is I think the best tenant is a national tenant, such as Starbucks, such as, such as Panera. And, and so I decided two years question. ago. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so are you, are you doing a lot of commercial stuff right now? Do you have a lot I, of commercial properties? I am looking into a lot of commercial, but I don't have to do a ton. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you're familiar with uh, 1031 exchange, all that stuff, right? Um, Correct, and, yeah. um, and basically cap rates. So I kind of, that's where I kind of started at was commercial, was learning commercial before I went into residential. Um, and so I have partner, I have a partner who we're basically trying to get up uh, our capital now. We're working our capital. We don't really, wholesaling is kind of what we're doing to, to get our capital. We want to buy that's right. uh, multifamily and uh, four to eight units, um, and maybe also a commercial building um, mm -hmm. at some point with tenants as, that, that you're talking about. So I just want, I wanted to kind of see where you were at. But I, yeah, I yeah, no, that's a fantastic question. And I'm, I'm glad you brought that up for one reason, is that as we have people who are trying to start in wholesaling, uh, if you guys, what I would advise you is talk to people like Tyrell, talk to people like me, talk to other wholesalers who have been doing wholesaling, uh, for a while and they're successful at it, you will find out one common denominator is that they don't stay in wholesaling. Wholesaling is a means to an end. And, and, and what I'm advising you guys to do is to have that in mind. What is your end, right? And so, and so with, uh, with, uh, with these buyers and tenants, national tenants, then, then your mindset really just shifts. Uh, I would advise you guys to listen to a guy on YouTube that I listen to all the time uh, what's his name? He, he built this company, Moose Investments, uh, Ma, uh, Mark, Mark Onofrio. I think that's his name, uh, Mark Onofrio. Uh, and so he does a lot of uh, triple net leases. And so a triple net lease is, is, is the Rolls Royce of real estate because you don't pay for the maintenance, the tenant does. Uh, you don't pay for the taxes, the tenant does, and you don't pay for the, for the, uh, uh, the rehab. So imagine buying a house where you can rent it out to somebody and the tenant does the rehab, the tenant pays the taxes, the tenant <clears throat> pays the insurance, the, pay, the tenant pays everything. And you just truly generate cash flow. Well, that happens 100% of the time in commercial real estate. So how many deals do you need? I mean, if your tenant is paying you $8,000 a month, how many buildings do you need? <laughs> <laughs> and a, a, a residential lease is only one year you know, on average, I mean, the majority of the time, you know, where you can get a triple net lease for 15 years and you have what is called rent increases. So if they, they can pay you 8,000 a month today, uh, but over 15 years, you can increase it by a percentage point. So, so you're at 8,000 this year. You know, maybe 8,200 next year, maybe 8,500 the following and all the way 15 years to where you can be at 11,000 in, in 15 years. So, so it's, a, it's, it's a much better invest, investment. Now, you need to learn the mechanics of real estate. So it's really good that you start with houses and land and everything else. 
but you need to have the end in mind. That's what I would advise everybody. Uh, the tenant, here's, here's a, 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 a kind of like a insider tip. When you go in, in Roseanne, you're talking about buying this house in, uh, in uh, West Palm, and you're talking about uh, qualifying for the mortgage. So when you go to the bank and you apply to get that loan, the bank is going to underwrite you as a borrower. But when you go and you put a tenant in your building, in a commercial building, the bank, if you want to get a loan for that building to buy it, the bank will underwrite the tenant so, so to give you a loan. So you get approved for a loan, but they run the national corporation's credit to get that loan because you have the building and they want the building and they'll give you a lease. So, so is the Rolls Royce commercial is the Rolls Royce of all real estate because you can do so many different things. I have a guy in the Midwest right now that they have two mortgages on a, on a mobile home park. And those mortgages are assumable and they're 30 year mortgages in commercial real estate. A typical mortgage is between five to 10 years, no more than 10 years typically. Uh, but th these guys were able to get a 30 year Fannie uh, and Freddie uh, loan. Uh, I don't know how they got it, but they're assumable. So they're giving me seller finance on that deal. Uh, and I'm assuming the mortgages. So once you go into commercial real estate, uh, it, it's like you're, you're going to think that you, uh, that you died and went to heaven. So however, however, I was able, sorry about that. I was able to only understand these concepts because I did it in residential. Go ahead, Tyra. You were saying, um, so I'm learning about uh, creative finance right now. Um, mm -hmm. and like seller financing and subject to and and um and things of that nature so mm -hmm. you're saying um so who got the assumable loan i guess is in that situation who ended up like getting that? the owner the owner yeah yep. okay. they refinanced so what they did is they bought a mobile home park that yep. had only like uh let's say 20 25 homes yeah. And over the last 20 years, they've been adding homes, which that's a that's a fantastic strategy, you guys. So here's what they did. And this is not a strategy that I did, but they taught me what they did uh, because I was looking into the deal to buy it. So what they said they did was they bought a mobile home park from a distressed seller 20 years ago, had about 20 homes on it. And their job was just to keep adding homes onto the park. OK. And, and they were just buying, they bought like a big machine, uh, like, a, like a truck, a big truck that, that moves these mobile homes. They bought that. And so they were just looking around the neighborhood, uh, around the city and stuff like that to buy uh, kind of like a distressed mobile homes to move into their park. And then they would rehab that, right? And, and then by doing that, they increased the value of the park because they're adding, they're doing a value add. Uh, so the home, uh, the mobile home park, when they bought it, they had only 20 homes, but they had a ton of land. And so they said, man, I can put, I can put an additional hundred homes on this park. And that's what they did. So they grew this mobile home park over the years by adding more homes, rehabbing them. And then they, they sell the mobile home and they rent the land under the mobile home. So they never get rid of the land. So the mm -hmm. land is what's making them money. Uh, and the homes, they're just flipping, brother. They just flip these houses. Mm -hmm. That's all they're doing. Yeah. <laughs> so think of that strategy as fantastic. So what they did after like 10 years, no, after like 15 years, they increased the value so much that they went to, uh, to the bank. They got a loan, a local bank uh, in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. And, uh, and so they kept getting all these loans because the value is higher. Why? Because they, they're creating greater cash flow. Uh, and so eventually they went to the government and they said, hey, we need a, a Freddie uh, Fannie uh, loan mortgage. And they did. They got a 30-year uh, loan. And now they're selling it. They're selling it. They, they worked so hard for 20 years. They, they made a good living. One property gave them 20 years worth of of living good right 
uh, because they kept flipping houses or flipping homes, mobile homes inside their own park. So you guys can just take that strategy and run with it and it works fantastic. And then eventually they, they're doing a 1031 exchange right now. So we're working on that with them. Are you, are you, are you helping them? You're helping them kind of buy something else. Yep. Yeah. And and, and park their money. Yeah. Park their money into tax liens and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So with the 1031, you, they have to use all of that money that, that they got, right. The profit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. 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 Else. Okay. yeah they have to go bigger they have to go bigger yeah. which is hard because yeah. they already have you know a nice property and that yeah. that is one property that they that they have they have apartment complexes and they also have uh, uh storage facilities so we're doing like a uh a, a portfolio deal with them yeah yeah with a ton of seller finance a ton, a ton of assumable mortgages and they're seller financing their uh their equity as well. So with the with that, are are you guys just gonna are you guys gonna pay them for X amount of time uh, mm -hmm. at a certain for a, at a certain price that y'all negotiate? Is that how that works? Yeah, that's how it works. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. how it works. But you have to come up with a down payment uh, yeah. because these are savvy investors and they want a nice down payment. Right. Uh, down payment is like ten million, something like that. Okay. Yeah. What's their portfolio worth? What's what's it worth? Uh, yeah. I'm not sure. I think we're close to. Uh, Close to sixty or seventy. Wow, something like that's that. Good. Yeah, that's a good down payment, though. That's that's that would yeah, make it's, somebody, it's uh, that would make somebody be willing to do all of that that seller financing. That's sure. right. Okay, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to obviously lower it. I was trying to be a shark and say, "Hey, zero down." <laughs> yeah. And they're like, "You go do that in houses. You don't do that in, uh, in yeah, commercials." There's no, there's no incentive. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's no incentive for them. Why would they do it? You know. But you can do it with some people in in uh, storage facilities. You could do that. Uh, I've seen people do that in storage facilities. Uh, you can also um, one of the their apartment complexes. Um, it has a ton of land next to it. Mm -hmm. So uh, what we're planning on doing with that is building a storage facility next to it. Okay. Oh Storage God. is great because you have tenants yeah. and that they don't live in, in in the unit. So when you have to evict somebody, you just put a lock and it's done. Oh my gosh! Yeah, I've heard storage units are, are in mobile home parks as were a big mm -hmm. emphasis um, at the mm -hmm. conference I was at. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, huge yeah. emphasis. They had like uh, mobile home park experts um, who had oh sweet and storage unit experts. A guy who's converting a um, a Kmart into a storage unit. Hmm. Wow. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah. Kmart's man. There's one right there in, in Jacksonville. You guys, yeah. in, uh, uh, I used to live in Mandarin. Uh, and uh, so there's a Kmart right there on uh, Saint, yeah. old St. Augustine and uh, yeah. St. Jose Boulevard. Yeah. yeah. That was you should, I called that guy. I called that guy one time, like four years ago. He's still trying to sell it. You guys should call it and see I, if we can put some together. They have it all fenced off. They have it all fenced off. Like, oh, oh wow. I tried calling, but I couldn't get no answer. Um, I've been trying to call and still can't get no answer. So I don't know what they're doing with it. Mm -hmm. I've been, been on it. Trying you know who owns it, Ben? No, I don't. I don't. I, I tried it. I tried it um, um, four years ago. Yeah. Uh, and I couldn't, I, couldn't, I couldn't get it to work back then. I also tried the one over on Blanding, Blanding yeah. and uh, West Connect mm -hmm. uh, that turned into an Amazon. I've heard ever since. So yeah. I, I tried doing that um, because I was I saw the trucks used to park there. Mm -hmm. So I uh, I'm like, man, that would be like a fantastic distribution center for Amazon. So so the, the point that I'm trying to make is like know who your buyer is, your end buyer. Yeah. So or your end tenant. And so I, I don't like the fact that I have to deal with uh, with regular people, you know, that I have to, only one little lease on. And, and, and once they leave, like. You know, like I have a house now, it's a liability because I have to pay or something, the mortgage, because I, I try to buy sub two when I do residential, yeah. you know, so, so, so if, if you think uh, like further ahead into your career, what's the ultimate tenant? And that's going to be your national tenant because they also buy. I also have a deal with, um, with uh, uh, gate gas stations where gate is buying. You're trying to get into land, bro. This is what you do. Go on, go on LinkedIn and, and, and find the leadership in uh, Gate Gas Station mm -hmm. and contact them. Make a connection on LinkedIn and okay. get on the phone with them and ask Gate 
what are you guys buying and where are you buying and how much are you buying? They'll tell you, oh, you know, we have a nice real estate agent that is doing everything for it. We're very happy with their No, no, no. no. Like, yeah, that, you're not happy with anything. Like I can get you better deals because right. remember, brother, you're a wholesaler. You can do much better marketing than a realtor. So instead yeah. of working for a flipper, why not work for Gate Gas Station and find them land? You know, I did a deal with them uh, three years ago where they were looking for a um, uh, two acres minimum, Okay. two acres minimum. And they're paying, guess how much they're paying per acre? They're paying, uh, they're paying a million dollars an acre at the time. So maybe right now they're paying uh, maybe 1.5 an acre, but they need yeah. two acre minimum. So Jeez. I was able to find a guy who had land mm -hmm. uh, and I called him. I'm like, what do you want for your, for your land? And it, it was three acres and he wanted 750. So okay. I put it under contract. And you're just double closing with gate gas station yeah. as your buyer, bro. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know um, what I mean? It's like, it's like you're a wholesaler. You just need to figure out like who your, your best buyer is. I, I don't like selling to flippers because th these guys are sharks, bro. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. you don't make any money. Mm -mm. Um, oh, I have. So I have a. Uh... I have a deal right now that I'm helping a buyer, um, or not a buyer, I'm sorry. I have a seller in California. They mm -hmm. own 1.15 acres on a frontage right on Old St. Augustine Road, right, oh, across, right, across, right across from a subdivision. And it's it, there's two parts. It's two parcels. They're both zoned residential. Mm -hmm. um, they're both about half an acre, maybe a little more. Um, and mm -hmm. the land is, looks like it's, she just had it fully cleared last week. Um, mm -hmm. And so I had a buyer in place. Um, he's kind of giving me the runaround. He said he, you know, he needs to get 150 liquid from Bank of America, whatever the whole deal. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, um, if you contact Gate or, or uh, Wawa or uh, all these aggressive gas stations that are expanding or aggressive retailers also, they're buying. You know who's really aggressive right now is uh, Panera. Panera is very aggressive right now. I mean, there's yeah. so many retailers that are aggressive. Uh, all you got to do, to, to implement that strategy is just kind of think who would buy that piece of land. Yeah. It, it, what corporation would buy that piece of land, right? What a corporation of, needs that and just contact them. They'll buy it. A lot, a lot of people have told me um, that I've talked to um, that my buyer is going to be a residential buyer because it's not enough acreage. So I've talked to uh, developers to see if they would be okay. interested in it. I've talked to, they're like, they're like, we only buy five acre minimum. So, um, it, I mean, it's too, so basically I'm, I'm basically, uh, trying to wholesale it for probably anywhere from 220 to 230. The lady, she initially wanted 250 for it. I got her down to, um, 210. Um, so I'm just trying to make a small spread on it, but, um, yeah. you know, if, if there's anybody that, you know, might be interested in that, um, it's there and yeah. And I, I would buy it myself. You know what I mean? It's it's yeah. one of those where you know if you develop it, you're getting you're gonna make your money because each one of those houses that are there selling next door are selling seven eighty. You know? Yeah, I know yeah. a developer that might be interested. Yeah, I'll, I'll yeah, send this it, guy. I'll send it to you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, this guy is is good. He's he's solid. He does a lot of work for uh, for Walmart. Okay. Uh, and uh, and he on the side he builds. Like that's what he does. It's like this guy is crazy, because uh, he he works with a lot of corporations like that. But on the side, he says, on the side, I do some uh, some uh, house developments. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so so he might be interested because he's not too. Um, that's not his main bread and butter. You know, yeah. it's just like a side gig that he has. He might be interested. He's got plenty of cash to to buy it. So send it the out. Only, the only send issue was, out. yeah. The only issue was is with the with the owner. She's like, all right, well, send me proof of funds. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I'm waiting on the guy to send me proof of funds. I was, I was looking for a property for him. And then sure. when it's not for proof of funds, he's like, oh, I don't, you know, I got to do this. I got to do that. Mm -hmm. So she's kind of, you know, she's still waiting. And then I told her, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to find a buyer for you for the mm -hmm. property, you know, at this yeah. price. So, um, yeah. So that's what I'm working I, with now. And she'll, yeah. she'll sign, she'll let me, she'll let me get it. I sent her a contract already. She was going to sign it. 
um, but you know, then she didn't have proof of funds. So, so basically, mm -hmm. all she wants to see is whoever I bring to the table can show her proof of funds to buy the property, and it's under contract. So, sweet, sweet. Yeah. Okay. So I already have the contract written up. It's that's just what has to happen. It's ready to go. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Shoot it on out, and I'll, I'll okay. see if if I can. Uh, I have two people in mind. Okay. We'll do. Um, did you All did right. you drop your did you drop your uh, your your email in the chat or? Oh, let me let me put it here. Okay. Um, I'll send you both of those that I have. Okay. But yeah, I got to drop, guys. But it was it was nice meeting you. Um, Likewise, brother. Thanks for putting this together, Ben, and uh, hopefully we can do much, many more and may have more. Oh people. yeah, definitely. Let's uh, yeah. let's uh, squat up as uh, Pays Morby says. Yep. <laughs> you as well, Tyrell. Thanks for all the information. Yeah, no problem. Thank you, guys, and I'll uh, I'll talk to you in the chat. Look All right. See you later. Thank you for being here, brother. Peace with you. Oh. What'd you say, sir? I said, look forward to doing JVs with you. Definitely. Definitely. I'll see y'all. Okay. See you later, brother. Yep. All right, you guys. That, I put my email on there on the chat. So, um, yeah, I have to get on to some, uh, some calls over here, but uh, it was great being here with you guys. Any additional questions before I let you go? I'm good. I think I've got everything. I think. Yeah, it was nice having Tyrell here because, um, you know, kind of like the same perspective we were talking about uh, for you guys starting out. Yeah, that's good. I'm going to write your email down so that I have it. Mm -hmm. um, Anyone else? Any questions? I think I went through every question on the chat as well. Let me verify here. Um, we are all good. Uh, we will. We will definitely keep doing these calls uh once a week so uh definitely i was trying to do more calls during the week but the problem i see with that is that i want to do them but uh, i want you guys to have stuff to do and 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 i want you to go and do that and then come back and you know next week we'll see like your progress does that make sense right. yeah it does i do have one question though so i started my llc and mm -hmm. I got everything done. You know, my LLC is good. I have my EIN number, all of that. So would it be good to get a um, bank account for my LLC um, so that I have, have that? Or is that not needed? Um, <clears throat> I would. I would. Uh, because. Um, you want to be ready when you send your contracts in uh, like you, you, you don't want to have a contract and then have to go set up the LLC and then the bank account, because then you have to deal with uh, earnest money deposits and things like that. And you want all of that to be inside that bank account. So I would do that. I would set that up. Okay. And another question, what mm -hmm. bank would be a good bank to set up an a uh, bank account, um, a bank account for that. Like I, yeah. I tried, I tried going to Chase, but I just didn't like how Chase was trying to. Like I didn't, I didn't like what what they were saying. I, mm -hmm. I googled, it and one place that I got was um. P, what was it? PNC, PNC Bank, I think is what it's called here in Jax. Mm -hmm. What I would do is I would find local banks. I, I would open bank. up with yeah with a with a local bank, 
there's one right there, or there used to be one on uh, on San Jose Boulevard that was just local. Because the reason why is because you're dealing with the with the uh, with the owner. You're dealing okay. with the owner, and like in my story with the guys in the Midwest with the with the mobile home park, that's how they grew because they would walk into the bank, and they spoke to the owner of the bank, and the bank would approve them right then and there. So they don't have to go through corporate. They don't have to go through all this red tape. So start off on the right foot and connect with a local bank and interview them and say, hey, do you guys work with investors? You, you know, I'm looking at buying some, some uh, rental property. Uh, don't tell people that you're going to flip or you're, gonna, you're going to do things like that. Just say right. you're, going to be, you know, you're going to be buying property as an investment. Uh, and then they can guide you. So that's how you start building your network. So okay. everything you do needs to be, you know, you need to enroll people Proper. to be a part of your team. Right. And I also was told, do not go in there and tell them that you're a wholesaler because they will shut you down. <laughs> yeah, don't do that. Yeah, yeah don't do that. So, Wholesalers have a bad, a bad uh, rap, rap, but, yeah. but it's a, uh, it is it, not is not um, we are let me just say this uh, because I don't want anyone to misinterpret as wholesalers we are probably the best marketers the best uh, the most creative right. people in the industry our right. brains work better than a lot of people in the industry but there's a lot of newbies that never end up doing a deal that give us a bad name. <laughs> <laughs> and they never even did a deal. You know what I mean? Because as a good wholesaler, uh, like I said, we work for, for, for the end buyers. That's what we do. And as I explained, my end buyers right now are going to be big corporations. So I have to be professional. I have to know what I'm doing. And you guys should treat it the same way. So um, what do you remember what the name of the local... See, I'm not from Jacksonville. I'm from Virginia. So... Okay. Yeah. I'm very new here in Jacksonville. I'm, I've only been here about a year now, so I'm still getting to know the area. Mm -hmm. I'm looking it up right now. Uh, the and, name of the bank is, uh, let's see. And should I like ask for like, a business line of credit to expand my business? Uh, yeah, yeah, you can for sure. For sure. Uh, Fidelity Bank, I think it is. Fidelity. Yeah. Yeah. But there's many, many other banks. So, so look, just, just, uh, uh, if you go in bigger pockets, uh, um, and just, just type on there, uh, search for, uh, for, uh, uh, small banks, small local banks uh, in Jacksonville. I think they have a directory. Local banks. Okay. Mm -hmm. Got you. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I hope you guys uh, enjoyed that call. Uh, and uh, we will be connecting again next week, probably Monday or Tuesday. Uh, we'll kind of keep it tentative so you guys can plan on it and um, we can catch up as to how uh, much progress you guys made and where you're at. Call, I sent you that PDF, Sarah, call that guy, just kind of have a conversation with him uh, and then uh, can't wait to talk to you guys next week. Great. Thank you so much, Ben. I appreciate everything. Hope everybody has a blessed week. No problem. Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you guys so thank you for being this here. This so informative and thank you. Looking forward to working with you guys. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Sweet. Sweet. Right. Ren, I'll talk to you later. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Bye-bye now. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.